Now, uh, Morris and I together want to talk about keeping spiritually fresh in the changing seasons of life and ministry. So we're going to start as singles, when we were single. Morris started 1965 to 1972 in, in Taiwan. And so he was there for seven years serving the Lord as a single man. And he has many stories to tell about that time. I don't know whether you can think of any that come to mind right now, but I know he spoke some yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> there are many stories from Taiwan days, but I remember I was asked to take a Bible study and it met in a very strange place. Uh, it met in a rubber factory, and a lot of the workers were tribes people that came down from the mountains, and the owner of the rubber factory was a Christian, and he built uh, accommodation for them so that uh, they had somewhere to live, and part of his care of them was to uh, have a Bible study running in the factory after they'd closed it down at night uh, and I would go in there and I would teach and there was a young man who was part of that group and then he asked if he could come by himself to where I was living and have one-on-one -on -one Bible teaching just the two of us and so I, I was very happy and uh, I had just been given uh, a tape recorder. Now, tape recorders are fairly obsolete today, but uh, the one I had was state-of-the-art, and I was actually very, very proud of it. And what we used to do, I would do the Bible study, and we would record it. And then he asked if he could borrow my tape recorder and when he went home to the village in the mountains, uh, could he take that tape recorder and replay the Bible studies to the people in the village? So I thought about it and I thought, okay, yeah, that's a good use for the tape recorder, but whatever you do, look after it. And so he would go up into the mountains and then uh, when he returned, he'd give me a report, and at one point, he was telling me that halfway up the mountain trail, getting near to the village, he encountered something that he'd never, never had before, and I asked him what it was, and he said, well, he said, basically, it was some kind of demonic spirit, and he said, I was really scared, but then he said, I remembered that Pastor Charman had said that we could pray in the name of Jesus and uh, the sword of the Spirit would uh, be very effective. And so he decided that uh, he would just take the word of God and apply it like a sword. And so he was telling me that he went up the mountain uh, waving his Bible and swishing it like a sword. And whatever this thing was, kept retreating. And so he was delighted. And so we kept doing that for uh, a few weeks. And then he came back one, one uh, week after he had shared. And he was very, uh, whatever the word is, very sad. He, he was upset. And I asked him what was wrong. And he said, well, he said, I was coming down the mountain and I slipped and your tape recorder uh, went over the side of the mountain and it's ruined. And I was thinking about my precious tape recorder and for a couple of seconds I was very, uh, I'm not sure whether I was going to tell him off or what, but in the end I said, look, brother, it's okay. It's just a tape recorder. 
for a few months, the people in your village have reaped the benefit of what you've been doing with me in study. So the tape recorder can be replaced. So don't worry about it. And uh, that was, I guess, a testimony to myself. I, I'm not usually uh, that kind when my special stuff is destroyed. But anyway, uh, it, it was a good relationship. And he learned heaps and so did I. Okay, meanwhile... I was back in New Zealand, and it, for me it was time of choices. As I told you, I had had this encounter with the Lord, and I had been transformed. But I'm not a routine person. I don't really like routines very much. I quite like being flexible. I quite like um, change. And so my devotional life, when I started as a Christian, was interesting. I loved Jesus and I loved to persevere, but I had to try all sorts of different methods, different aids in my devotion life as a young person, as a single. And sometimes when it was really short, I don't know if you've heard of the little book called Daily Light, but the little book Daily Light was often my devotional book because I was in a hurry and it was the last minute and I wasn't doing very well. And that was all I had time for. But anyway, God was patient with me, and I had to persevere. Um, I was in a good church. What a great church. Alison and John were in the same church, and Morris and I. And at that time, our church was just wonderful. The Holy Spirit was working. There were lots of very godly elders, strong eldership, and... The Holy Spirit was at work, and it was, for me, a time of growing in a secure environment. And then God called me to Bible college, and for three years I went and studied there, and there was a good routine. So my devotion life was settled into a good routine there. And then I did wet candidates course. I had to go to Australia and do it for four months. And in those days it was four months, not what you've got now. I think when Morris did it, it was six months. But it was a good time for routine for my quiet time as well and so on. So, um, yeah, the devotional time was good. And the other thing that God was teaching me just before I went to Bible college was about tithing. And I thought, well, the Bible says we should tithe. And um, I hadn't really been tithing, so I thought, yeah, I should do this. So I started tithing. So I just thought, well, I could tithe into our church, but it's quite a big church, and a lot of people are tithing. And um, so what should I do? And I asked my dad. My dad was the leader of WEC New Street together. We got married in 1972, and we lived in a flat away from the WEC headquarters for six months just to get to know each other because actually we hadn't really had time together at all. Morris was in Taiwan and I was in New Zealand right up until we got married pretty well. And uh, so we started having our devotional times together and we started learning and adjusting to living together. Um, at that time, my sister, my older sister and her husband came back from Africa. They'd been serving the Lord in Africa. Now, when I, I told you that I was a bit of a rebellious girl when I was younger, and when my sister came home, the Lord reminded me of what I'd said to her when she came to New Zealand just before she went to the mission field. She'd come to New Zealand after doing Bible college, and she was um, lovely and spiritual and wanting to please the Lord. She was a beautiful singer and she sang at meetings, and she hadn't really been at home very much in her life because she'd been at the missionary children's home in Scotland while my parents were overseas. So we didn't really know each other that well. But when she came and stayed with us, she kept sort of, to my, to my mind anyway, as a teenager, preaching at me. And one day I got so mad with her, I said to her, look, Miriam, just go back where you came from and leave me alone. And I thought afterwards, what a terrible thing to say when I really came through to the Lord. The Lord reminded me what I'd said and how 
probably I'd hurt Miriam really badly because he was this crazy young sister that she didn't know very well and this older sister, lovely godly older sister that I didn't know very well but we really misunderstood each other and we didn't help each other so when she came back she was married and came back to New Zealand very tired and a bit down from her time in Ghana because it had been quite a tough time and the Lord said to me I want you to go and apologize to your sister for how you treated her and so I went to her and I had said to her Miriam I know what I said to you when you t were first in New Zealand hurt you deeply and I just want to apologize and put things right. And so we listened to each other's stories and we listened to each other's journeys and it helped us to understand each other and our relationship became so much closer after that. And, you know, I didn't know then but my sister died only a few years later. And just think about it. If I hadn't apologized to her, you know, she would have gone and I would have carried that burden of regret all the rest of my life. But I praise God that he nudged me to apologize to her and to restore that relationship because that's important if we're going to be stay spiritually fresh with Jesus, we have to be willing to put relationships right. So after living together in marriage, Morris and I, for six months, we went and lived at the headquarters, and then we started a ministry. <clears throat> God called us very clearly to work with overseas students in New Zealand. And there were many overseas students in New Zealand and in those days there weren't very many people from overseas in New Zealand and so it was very hard for these new students coming into New Zealand to relate to people and to have people interested in them and their lives <clears throat> and we worked in this hostel we ran a hostel we actually started a hostel where 12 to 14 students would live with us and then we would have ministry to international students um, doing all sorts of things with those students. And we did that from 1976 to 1970, the end of 1978. Can you think of anything in the hostel? What we used to do, uh, we had the 12, 14 students living with us and the church that we were from, they realized that strategically they were placed very close to the university and should be working with university students. So we in the hostel had an arrangement with the church that once a month the church would hire buses and our students would advertise meetings or some sort of gathering and once a month sometimes we would get 200 overseas university students coming to the activities that we as a hostel and the church uh, put together and it was absolutely brilliant because the bulk of these international students knew very little about Jesus and I can remember very clearly we had one student uh, living with us uh, at the time he was living somewhere else but uh, he came to one of those meetings and we had a challenge and then everybody went home but the next day there was a knock on the door in our house and here was this young man and I asked him, what can I do for you? And he said, well, he said, I'm actually wanting to accept Jesus as my saviour. And I thought, wow. And that was a highlight of the very beginning days of our hostel. We were there to see Asians introduced to Jesus. And this was the first fruit of that ministry. A young man called Ku Kahim from Malaysia. But he was 
just an absolute joy to us. So one of the challenges for us when we started the hostel was that we had a two-year-old and I was pregnant with the next child. Now, how do you keep a devotional life? How do you have a ministry and have children and all that? And I knew, I'd said, Lord, I want to be the best missionary I can be. I want to be the best wife I can be. And I want to be the best mother I can be. But I don't know how it's all going to work out. And when I was in the hospital having my second child, we went, I went in there and we left a hostel with five students. And when I came out, they'd already moved to a hostel with 12 students. And I knew it was right and I knew God was in it. But I said, Lord, how am I going to do these things well? And the Lord said to my mum, give her a book on, um, what's the name? The people from The Sound of Music, anyway, the lady that wrote The Sound of Music, whatever her name is, the, anyway. <laughs> um, Von Trapp. Von Trapp, the lady Von Trapp, anyway. She wrote, actually, a devotional book once. And she wrote a devotional book on the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And my mum gave me that book because she knew I liked The Sound of Music. And uh, anyway, she gave me that book, and the book actually said, who was more in the center of God's will than Mary, the mother of Jesus? And yet she had to travel over difficult roads on a donkey, about almost nine months pregnant. Who was more in the center of God's will than Mary, the mother of Jesus, and who was probably breastfeeding when she had to travel over the desert to go to Egypt. And that just really encouraged me that because we're in the center of God's will, it won't be easy. But God was with Mary. And I'm sure they used the money from the, the Magi's gifts to help them to get to Egypt and lived in Egypt. You know, all of those things, God went ahead and provided and looked after them. And he gave the strength. And he gave us the strength in the hostel. A young lady came up to us and said, I'd love to be a missionary overseas one day, but I would like to get to know Asians. Can I come and live in the hostel and work with you so that I can get to know the uh, how Asians think and how they are? And so this young lady, Pat, Patty, came and stayed with us in the hostel for two years. And what a blessing she was and what a help. So God goes ahead and God provides when we don't know what to do. The other thing was devotional times. I had, um, you know, we'd been having regular quiet times together, and then the babies came along, you know, and you, but you're trying to have your devotional time, and a baby's crying, and this and that and the other. A lot of couples actually almost stop having them. But we decided we will keep on having our devotional life. One of us may be changing a nappy, I might be breastfeeding, the baby might be crying and I might have to walk around the room, but we will carry on our devotional life. We won't allow this to interrupt anything. And our children will see that this is what we do. This is who we are. Yes. We want to spend time with the Lord, and that's what we did, even in the busy hostel times. And we praise the Lord for that. We also had devotional time every dinner with the students in the hostel so that they would be prayed for and they would hear the, the word of God regularly. And then on Saturday, there was always a Bible study that Morris led with the students and they all had to agree to go to that if they were going to live in the hostel. So we praise the Lord for that. Then after the hostel finished, uh, we managed to find accommodation for the students to go to other places and other hostels were starting to open that were Christian ones. Then the Lord had us live at the headquarters for one year again. And this was a time of interlude or rest and reflection and um, just renewal. And from that time, it was preparation for us to go to Singapore, where God led us next. And Singapore, we were there from 1980 to 1988. There's a lot of adjustments, very different, different lifestyle. 
the school for the children was very challenging. Visitors were coming and going the whole time from overseas. Mm. Our children had accidents. It was a very, very busy ministry time, especially for Morris. Um, he often preached three or four times a Sunday in different churches. He had lots of camps that he also had to speak in. Once they heard that he was a good speaker, he was just very, very busy. And for me, when I got to Singapore, I just started developing fears. And I realized that the fears I had earlier in life just returned. Mm. And I had to start asking the Lord how to get rid of these fears. Mm. And I went to some meetings and people talked about it. Sometimes I went to a meeting and people asked anybody wanted prayer. So I went forward and asked the Lord, please, Lord, could you just deliver me from these unreasonable fears? Mm. And he started to do that. The other thing was that I remember once my mother saying to me, um, when you've got a, a problem, why don't you look up scriptures that are antidotes to that problem and put them up and basically read them three times a day like you would medicine. And so I wrote up all the scriptures about um, perfect love casts out fear, all of these kind of verses. And I wrote them up and put them up places and I just looked at them every day and I just say, Lord, you've said that in your word, perfect love casts out fear. Fill me with your perfect love so that I have less and less fear. And gradually that time the fear started to wane. And so I praise God for that. How did we stay physically, spiritually fresh in that season? Well, really for the children, we added a daily devotional time for them. At dinner time, we would have a devotional time with the children. They loved it, we loved it. And if we had visitors in the house, they just had to join in because we would have our devotional time with the children. And that was every day at dinner time because the children needed it. The pressures at school and the pressures of life in Singapore for children was actually quite hard. And we needed, the children needed some feeding. The other thing I learned in Singapore quite early was Psalm 8 verse 2. If you don't know that one, look it up. Psalm 8, verse 2. The Bible there says, Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have ordained praise. And the old translation said, To still the enemy and the avenger. And what that really meant for us was that praise is a children's spiritual protection. So... We got lots of praise cassettes and tapes and CDs and we started singing to the children. I always sang praise and worship songs to the children when I put them to bed at night. Uh, we often sang together and even danced around the home. Some of the new scripture and songs were had quite a Jewish beat and we loved them. And we used to sing them at home and dance around the house. And all of us, it was good for us. It was good for all of us just to have fun praising and worshipping the Lord together. And it gave my children a love for praise and worship. And I thank the Lord for that. We had a Buddhist medium living right next door to us in the first flat that we were living in. And, you know, when she worked, she would chant or she'd gong gongs or ting cymbals and all sorts of noises like that. So we just cranked up our praise and worship and just praised the Lord. And the children always said that they felt very safe and cocooned in that apartment, even though it wasn't the best and the nicest apartment in Singapore. It was a pretty simple because Singapore is a very expensive place to live. But praise the Lord that he was with us and we and the children knew that we could praise him and he would be with us. So that was a, a blessing. The other things was, that, as Morris said before, we went to some conferences for our own spiritual good because we were so busy giving out all the time. Whenever there was a good spiritual conference coming that we'd heard about, and of course in Singapore there were a lot of international speakers coming, but we found that we could just go to a conference if we were free, 
Sometimes it was when Morris was in ministry, as he said yesterday, he was doing ministry himself. And then the Lord would give us opportunity to listen to other speakers at times during some of the camps that we were at. And that would be encouragement to us in building us up. You can't always do that when you're in a very isolated place. I know like for John and Alison out in the tribal areas, you can't do that so easily. But God will give other ways to refresh and renew you in other places. One of the challenges that we had in Singapore too was just after we left our church to go to Singapore, after being such an amazing church, our church split. And it was a terrible time for us. We were going to Singapore. It was a very expensive place. And financially, New Zealand dollar wasn't so good. But Singapore was getting stronger and stronger dollar. And our church split. So basically, half our allowance very quickly wasn't coming in. And the interesting thing is that uh, the church had a farewell service for us. And uh, I preached. And then the pastor got into the pulpit and uh, prayed over us. And then he closed the meeting. And just as he was closing, he announced to the whole church that he was resigning. And uh, so it was our farewell. And at, in the same kind of breath. breath, he resigned from the leadership of the church. And then a few years later, we came back to New Zealand. We went to the church and I was invited to preach. And so I preached again a few years after the first resignation. And when I'd finished, the new pastor stood up and he resigned. And Ruth said to me, she said, uh, when we come home on furlough, I don't think you should preach because <laughs> the pastors all resign. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, But, you know, God still provided. God gave us extra blessings when we needed them. And our church in Singapore that we started to go to, they started supporting us amazingly. They even paid for us to do some the further theological studies in Singapore that we had to do part-time because the government wanted to see us upgrading to give us a visa. So the church said, okay, we'll pay for you to do these studies. So that was an amazing thing that God provided. When one door closes, God will open another. And we didn't ever make our needs known. That's the thing. We didn't tell people what we needed, but God provided. In Singapore also, we had family challenges. Family members died. Three family members died while we were in Singapore. Morris had a very serious illness. I had an unexpected pregnancy. Amazingly, God provided for our travel needs, our baby needs. Our New Zealand church even sent somebody over to help when the baby came because we were already doing a busy ministry and having a baby as well just was, you know, amazingly Wonderful, but busy. And what a blessing she was. Paula is still a friend of ours. And praise God, in the middle of difficulties, we saw God blessing in timing, in provision, in encouragements. We adapted and faith grew as we trusted God more. What a blessing that was. You know, at the end of the time in Singapore, we actually ran away from WEC for a couple of years. We had an opportunity to pastor a church in Melbourne. And I think probably partly because we were tired, but also um, we just wanted a change. We went and took this pastorate in Australia. We pastored a Chinese year, church for two years. And we learned some good things and what, what to do and what not to do, how not to do things and how to do things. It was a good learning thing. 
And then, you know, we went to Tasmania. God clearly called us to come back into WEC and to go to Worldview Missionary Training College on the teaching staff for 12 years. But that church supported us for 12 years that we were in Tasmania. So God knew what he was doing, even though we thought, oh, perhaps we're running away from WEC. But actually, God used that to supply our needs during the time we were in Tasmania again. We both taught and did pastoral care um, Morris was usually the one in charge of the pastoral care for the whole college. It was a live-in college, so everybody was residential. And our two children were teenagers, and we had a young one as well, 10 years younger. It was a very busy time again, working in a large staff team and with students. How did we keep spiritually fresh in that environment? Well, we had daily devotionals. We kept that up. And often we would do daily walks together early in the morning. It was the best time, sometimes after lunch, but often it was early in the morning or sometimes uh, after dinner at night. But we would talk, and that was good for us both, to have time together just to talk and sometimes to pray. But the da daily devotionals carried on. We started reading different books. There were a lot of books available, but we also chose to read certain books to help us, to encourage us, to build us up. And, um, yeah, there's so many books that I know when Morris, you talk about them when you read a book sometimes. Because I was responsible for coordinating the member care uh, in the college, at that time there were 96 students. Now, we didn't do all the member care, but we coordinated it and we uh, had a team uh, working to just be available to the students. And I would be reading a book and within, I could almost guarantee, within a few days of finishing a particular book, a student would come with a problem that had already been explained in the book that I was reading. And uh, instead of floundering around trying to think, what, am I, what do I do with, with this student? Uh, I knew because the Lord had guided my reading and uh, they were very special times. And for a couple of years in that time at the college, we saw a moving of the Holy Spirit and it was just absolutely brilliant and I don't understand all the reasons why it was just that small window of two years but a lot of outstanding things happened in that two years and we haven't talked about this one before but I, I would like to t tell you about a student who had been coming to me for weeks uh, with issues from his earlier life. Uh, he was a missionary kid. So at some point he was moved from the mission field to Australia to study in a, in a boarding school. His parents stayed on the field and he was in the boarding school. And uh, probably from the age of eight. But uh, he 